Good morning. Welcome to Rutledge Falls today. We are so glad you are here. And uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, uh, it's normally a little brighter uh, and a little cooler. Um, but we, uh, we've got some air conditioner problems, as in we don't have any at all uh, in here. And so by the end of today, this might be a Judgment House reenactment, and you can imagine what this room uh, would be uh, as by the end of it. Right now, we're good, but I don't know. Uh, if you could refrain from breathing this morning, that would help us. Um, and uh, just maybe instead of singing, no, I'm not going to do that to Sam. You sing out, we'll, we'll make it together. Um, we anticipated this. We ordered a new unit for the sanctuary in December, um, and it is still not here. Uh, and so, uh, and will not be here maybe for another month or so. They originally told us May, and uh, as you can tell, we are in July. It is not here, and uh, it will be here eventually. So, uh, we'll know more about whether we can get a quick fix on this one um, 
tomorrow. Uh, and so maybe we'll be back in here next Sunday, but maybe we'll be meeting somewhere else. I don't know. Uh, maybe in the, in the old church, but we'll figure that out. But we're going to continue to, to gather and worship together, okay? So we're going to keep the lights a little, a little lower uh, because they bring a lot of heat. And, uh, and so just, just know that's why it's a little dimmer in here today. And uh, that's why we're going to keep those doors open, keep some cool air blowing in from the uh, lobby out there because that's on a different unit. So it'll be a little different this morning, but we will have a great time and we'll uh, still praise the Lord together. Hopefully you got a bulletin on your way in and I'll let you know of a few things that are coming up. Uh, and if you're a guest with us this morning, please fill out one of those cards in the pew in front of you. Drop that in the offering plate here in a little while, okay? Uh, we've got a business meeting tonight following the evening service. Most likely our evening service will be in the fellowship hall tonight. So if you come tonight, and uh, I would encourage you to come tonight, uh, we're going to do some uh, recap of our California trip and our Wyoming trip tonight as well. Uh, and then hopefully in a week or two, we'll have a recap of our Belize uh, trip as well. But tonight, uh, California and Wyoming. So I invite you to come and hear what happened on those trips. And then we'll have a business meeting following that, most likely all in the fellowship hall. So please come be a part of that. Okay. Softball team plays Tuesday night and uh, we got rained out last Tuesday night. So there are not just two games this Tuesday, there are three games. And so you can make a whole night out of it. Okay. We'll be there literally all night long on Tuesday and you can come and uh, support the team and be a part of that. Okay. No Wednesday night service this week. As we get closer to school, I'll tell you why we do that. It just gives our uh, leaders, volunteers, a chance to reset and make preparations uh, for uh, the fall semester. And so no Wednesday night service this week, all right? Uh, on Sunday night, August 6th, we've done this the last couple of years and we'll do it again. Uh, Grace Baptist in Tullahoma has their spectacular Sunday nights and we have joined them uh, for one of those nights each and every year, the last couple of years. And so this week, uh, this year on August 6th, instead of service here, we'll head over to Grace Baptist. It's at 6 p.m. just as ours is. And Dr. Randy Davis, he is the leader of the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board, executive director is his title, and he will be preaching. And then uh, Todd Green from First Baptist Manchester will be leading worship. So it's just a great opportunity to gather with other churches in our community and to hear from uh, the leader of our convention of churches here in Tennessee. So that is Sunday night, August 6th, okay? Good News Club training, Saturday, August 19th. If you uh, have been volunteering with us for Good News Club or you are interested in volunteering for Good News Club, I know we've got a, a, quite a few new folks, and if you are interested in being a part of that or even have questions about what Good News Club is, that's our after-school club that meets at Hickerson on Mondays uh, while school is in session. So if you are interested in being a part of that, come see me or you can sign up for the training out at the Welcome Center. Okay, kids re returned from camp yesterday. They had a great week. And uh, so thank you to all the leaders, parents, and children who were a part of that. Kids City Church um, will head out today. And I know many of you will be happy about that. And some of you may want to be a child today and to be able to go to Kids City Church because they have air conditioning uh, at Kids City Church. And we do not. All right. Promotion Sunday, August 6th. So just be aware of that. We'll have kids moving up out of preschool into the children's department, out of the children's department, into youth, all of those things. Okay. And then for our youth volunteers, a meeting with me after service today over in the youth building. So if you are a Sunday school teacher or a volunteer in any capacity uh, in our youth ministry, would love for you to be a part of that uh, this afternoon right after service, okay? So that is what is happening, and we hope you'll find a place to be a part of what the Lord is doing here at Rutledge Falls. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning, welcome those around you, and we will begin to sing in just a few moments.
All right, welcome to Rutledge Falls Baptist Church. Uh, we are definitely feeling the spirit this morning. So uh, if you remain standing, we'll go ahead and we will sing some songs together. So sing along. Full of wonder, full of fear. Come be old this power and glory, yet with confidence strong near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bids to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your Beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come in, lift your hands and raise your This path before us, he is walking with the still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to him, he hears your So we're going to go ahead and sing A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, which does not have a backing track. So <laughs> excuse that mishap. Uh, so we're going to sing A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. And this song talks about Christ being our fortress, the one who has saved us, the one who keeps us, the one who holds us. So as we sing this song, uh, let us just remember that in, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives and even this morning. So let us sing A Mighty Fortress. Fortress is our guide, a bulwark never failing. Our Albert amid the flood, a mortal hills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel aid. On earth is not his evil. And if we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. 
comes from John chapter 1, and this is verses 1 through 5. And all throughout this morning, we're singing about Christ, the one who has come and redeemed us. And this section of scripture talks about Christ being the word, being made manifest here on earth, um, and, and how Christ has been eternally existent, and it's a wonderful mystery. So that's going to be our next song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, which walks through the entire life of Jesus. So as we sing this, and as we read these words here in just a moment, uh, the, the main theme of our service in worship this morning is the life of Jesus and how our worth is not a part of us. That's one of our songs of the month for this month. That's going to be a causation of Christ being the one who has come and redeemed us. So let's read uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light that shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. So this is a foreshadowing of Christ, Christ being the word made flesh. And so in this song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, it kind of alludes to what we've been singing, what we just read, that Christ is the one who has come. He is the word made flesh. So let us sing together, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery.
Christ the Lord upon a tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the Father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love untold Come be all the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But, but no grave could ever restrain him Praise the Lord, he, he's alive What a foretaste of deliverance How a
Thank you so much for Jesus, that indeed in him we have all that we need. Our souls are satisfied in him and in him alone. So Lord, I pray as we uh, endure this day, even as difficult as it may be, Lord, I pray that we would once again know that you are our soul's satisfaction, that you are the one who is going to ultimately give us purpose and meaning in life. So Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time of giving, bless this time of hearing. Lord, bless our time as we respond later on to what you have said to us in your written word. Lord, we love you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and I'll ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way forward this morning. If you do start to feel a little too hot, a little too warm, uh, there is video and audio in the fellowship hall as well as air conditioning. Okay? Who knows? I might just walk in there in the middle of all this. Okay? Uh, and keep talking. Y'all can listen to me from in here. But if you do, if you do start to feel a little too warm, um, you can make your way back there. Okay? All right. Uh, we did a switcheroo last week, so Andy is going to come up and pray for us this morning. It's really that hot up here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Y'all will pray with me. God, thank you so much for today and allowing us to gather here and worship you, AC or no AC. And uh, God, I just pray that you bless this offering and uh, use it, Lord, for your kingdom's sake. And uh, God, please help us to focus and keep our attention here as Evan brings the word and help us to take something away from today's message. In holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. And as those are being passed, our kids can make their way over here to Miss Donna for Kid City Church. Obviously, I've got my own personal fan here, so if you see me stepping to this side often this morning, you know why. And I might keep this even after the AC starts working again. All right, turn to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, I told you last week that I have a plan for the next couple of weeks, and obviously a baby could come and uh, changed those plans, but I am here today, and those plans so far have not been changed. And so, we are going to cover plagues 4 through 9 this morning, uh, Exodus chapter 8. We covered the first three last week, and we'll cover 4 through 9 this morning. And then next week, the plan is to look at the tenth and final one, uh, which is um, what we all know uh, as kind of the, the final piece and the ultimate foreshadowing of Jesus coming to be the lamb slain for the sins of the world. So we'll look at four through nine this morning. And uh, we've seen the Nile turned to blood 
We've seen frogs, which were an object of worship in Egypt. Uh, now they have more frogs than they know what to do with. And uh, in fact, the uh, frogs are so worshipped that they, uh, many scholars believe that it was a no-no uh, to kill them. And so as there are more and more frogs, you can imagine they're not able to dispose of them uh, because it is against everything they believe in. Okay, uh, then the frogs go away and the gnats come and the gnats are now buzzing around everywhere and we can imagine that we have gnats here and typically it only takes one or two to annoy the fire out of us and they have swarms of them everywhere. Okay, we also see a few things happening in the first three in that Pharaoh's magicians, his, uh, his court jesters, whatever they might be, are able to reproduce. They're not able to actually fix the problems, but they are able to uh, reproduce uh, what the Lord is doing through Moses and Aaron in the first two. There's no mention of that. They're unable to do it in uh, the third one. And then from now on, they have no power. And we're going to see... Uh, the intensity of these plagues heighten as we go through them this morning. Uh, we're going to see a distinction now made between the people of Israel and the people of Egypt. There's no mention of that in the first three. And so our best guess is that it affected everyone in the land. But now these plagues begin to affect, affect only the Egyptians. There's another similar pattern that happens in uh, the first nine plagues, and that is in one through three, the first one, you see Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh in the morning, and then they meet with him later in the day when the second one comes along, uh, and then the third one comes along just by the decree of God through Moses. And then that pattern takes place in Numbers 4, 5, and 6. They meet again in the morning afternoon and then just at the time the Lord says same things happen in seven eight and nine again there's so many different avenues that we could go down as we study these uh, I talked a little bit last week about some of the different Egyptian gods that are being shown to be powerless uh, and I'm not going to mention them by name although we could uh, because that continues in these plagues as well uh, but we're going to look at them as a whole and consider what the Lord is doing uh, in bringing this judgment and these signs, of wonder, signs and wonders upon the land of Egypt. Remember, in chapter 5, uh, Pharaoh has asked the question, who is the Lord, who is Yahweh, that I should obey him? And last week we saw that the Lord is now making himself clear to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt who he is, what his name is, and what that represents. So, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to ask you to stand this morning because we are going to read a large section of Scripture. We're going to read from the uh, verse 20 of chapter 8 through chapter 9 as well as through chapter 10. It's going to take us a little while to get through it. But if you can sit down and binge watch a Netflix show or sit in a movie for two hours, you can listen to the reading of scripture. Okay. I promise you will make it in seminary. Uh, I had a new Testament class and my professor, uh, said, I want you to set your Bible down, set your phone down. And I want you to just listen. And he read through all of Galatians as the church at Galatia would have heard it. They would have heard it as one letter from Paul without all the verse and chapter markings, just a letter from the heart of Paul to the people in the church of Galatia. So he didn't want us reading along. He didn't want us doing all those things. You can follow along this morning because uh, I want you to know I'm not making any of this up. This is from the word of God, but we're going to uh, spend some time here just reading through this narrative of what is happening through the hand of God in the land of Egypt. So Exodus chapter eight, beginning in verse 20. The Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh when you see him going out to the water. Tell him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you will not let my people go, then I will send swarms of flies against you, your officials, your people, and your houses. The Egyptians' houses will swarm with flies and so will the land where they live. But on that day, I will give special treatment to the land of Goshen where my people are living. No flies will be there. This way you will know that I, the Lord, 
am in the land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will take place tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Thick swarms of flies went into Pharaoh's palace and his officials' houses. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined because of the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the country. But Moses said it would not be right to do that. Because what we will sacrifice to the Lord our God is detestable to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what the Egyptians detest in front of them, won't they stone us? We must go a distance of three days into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he instructs us. Pharaoh responded, I will let you go and sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but don't go very far. Make an appeal for me. As soon as I leave you, Moses said, I will appeal to the Lord. And tomorrow the swarms of flies will depart from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. But Pharaoh must not act deceptively again by refusing to let the people go and sacrifice to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh's presence and appealed to the Lord. The Lord did as Moses had said. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. Not one was left, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let them go and keep holding them, then the Lord's hand will bring a severe plague against your livestock in the field, the horses, donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing of all that the Israelites own will die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the Lord did this the next day. All the Egyptian livestock died, but none among the Israelite livestock died. Pharaoh sent messengers who saw that not a single one of the Israelite livestock was dead, but Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he did not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of furnace soot. And Moses is to throw it toward heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the land of Egypt. It will become festering boils on people and animals throughout the land of Egypt. So they took furnace soot and stood before Pharaoh. Moses threw it toward heaven and it became festering boils on people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart And he did not listen to them, as the Lord had told Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. For this time I am about to send all my plagues against you, your officials and your people. Then you will know there is no one like me on the whole earth. By now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague and you would have been obliterated from the earth. However, I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known on the whole earth. You are still acting arrogantly against my people by not letting them go. Tomorrow at this time, I will rain down the worst hail that has ever occurred in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Therefore, give orders to bring your livestock and all that you have in the field into shelters. Every person and animal that is in the field and not brought inside will die when the hail falls on them. Those among Pharaoh's officials who feared the word of the Lord made their servants and livestock flee to shelters. But those who didn't take to heart the Lord's word left their servants and livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven. And let there be hail throughout the land of Egypt on people and animals and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail. Lightning struck the land and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. The hail with lightning flashing through through it was so severe that nothing like it had occurred in the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout the land of Egypt, the hail struck down everything in the field, both people and animals. The hail beat down every plant of the field and shattered every tree in the field. The only place it didn't hail was in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. So Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron. I have sinned this time, he said to them. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the guilty ones. 
Make an appeal to the Lord. There has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. So Moses said to him, when I have left the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail so that you may know the earth belongs to the Lord. But as for you and your officials, I know that you still do not fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were destroyed because the barley was ripe and the flax was budding, but the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed since they are later crops. Moses left Pharaoh in the city and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased and rain no longer poured down on the land. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his officials. So Pharaoh's heart was hard and he did not let the Israelites go as the Lord had said through Moses. So then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart. And the hearts of his officials, so that I may do these miraculous signs of mine among them, and so that you may tell your grandson, uh, your son and grandson, how severely I dealt with the Egyptians and performed miraculous signs among them. And you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and told him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let my people go, then tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will eat the remainder left that, you, that escaped the hail. They will eat every tree that you have growing in the fields. They will fill your houses, all your officials' houses, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something your fathers and grandfathers never saw since the time they occupied the land until today. Then he turned and left Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh's officials asked him, how long must this man be a snare to us? Let the men go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Don't you realize yet that Egypt is devastated? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, Pharaoh said, but exactly who will be going? Moses replied, we will go with our young and with our old. We will go with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds because we must hold the Lord's festival. And he said to them, the Lord would have to be with you if I would ever let you go and your families go. Look out, you're heading for trouble. No, go, just able-bodied men, worship the Lord since that's what you want. And they were driven from Pharaoh's presence. The Lord then said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt and the locusts will come up over it and eat every plant in the land, everything that the hail left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. And the Lord sent an east wind over the land all that day and through the night. By morning, the east wind had brought in the locusts. The locusts went up over the entire land of Egypt and settled on the whole territory of Egypt. Never before had there been such a large number of locusts, and there never will be again. They covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was black, and they consumed all the plants on the ground and all the fruit on the trees that the hail had left. Nothing green was left on the trees or the plants in the field throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh urgently sent for Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Please forgive my sin once more and make an appeal to the Lord your God so that he will just take this death away from me. Moses left Pharaoh's presence and appealed to the Lord. And then the Lord changed the wind to a strong west wind and it carried off the locusts and blew them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the Israelites go. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, and there will be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for three days. One person could not see another, and for three days they did not move from where they were, yet all the Israelites had light where they lived. Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go, worship the Lord. Even your families may go with you. Only your flocks and herds must stay behind. Moses responded, you must also let us have sacrifices and burn offerings to prepare for the Lord our God. Even our livestock must go with us. Not a hoof will be left behind because we will take some of them to worship the Lord our God. We will not know what we will use to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was unwilling to let them go. Pharaoh said to them, leave me, make sure you never see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you will die. As you have said, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. 
So we have these increasingly destructive signs and wonders in judgment against the people of Egypt. And we see throughout this uh, divine distinction made between the Israelites living in the land of Goshen and those who are a part of the Egyptians living in Egypt proper. Okay, Goshen, uh, we're not entirely sure where it was, but uh, it's somewhere near, but not what we would call uh, the city and the, the, the place of Egypt in which uh, Pharaoh and his officials and others lived. And so we see throughout these plagues this distinction being made between what happens to the people of Israel and what happens to the people of Egypt. As God brings and rains down judgment, literally in some cases, upon the people of Egypt, we see that in the land of Goshen, just as there is uh, no flies, there's no uh, locusts, there's no hail. It even says that wherever they go, there is light. And, and you can only, I, I can only imagine what that experience was as God shows himself to be uh, the author and the maker and sustainer of all creation, right? It's all his, and so he can, he can manipulate it and he can use it and bend it to his will because he is the one who made it. And so as he makes darkness in one place and light in another or hail fall on one place and not fall on another, he makes this distinction between those who are his and those who are not his. He, as he rains down this judgment upon which he calls in the very beginning, that's what these are. He is judging the wickedness of the people of Egypt. He's judging the wickedness of Pharaoh. And we see multiple times throughout this a, a different line and a different description for what's happening in Pharaoh's heart. I don't, I don't know if you picked up on it, but in all of this text, there are three different descriptions for what's going on in Pharaoh's heart. There's one uh, that says Pharaoh hardened his heart. We've talked about this before. There's another that says, and multiple times it says, the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. And then there's another description that just says Pharaoh's heart was hard. And we'll get to that in just a few moments, but we're, we're seeing these distinctions come up. We're seeing this judgment made, but while judgment is being made, there's protection for the people of Israel. And we live in a world that is a little bit uncomfortable with God showing himself in this way. You often say, man, the God of the Old Testament is a mean and wrathful God, and that's just not who God is. But I'm just here to tell you this morning, the same God that judged Egypt is the same God who makes judgments today. He has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he still judges the wicked now, we may not see it in the form of plagues going on around us. We, we may not see it in these forms of distinction because I just don't think we would even be bright enough to recognize it. We, we live in such a world that's so dull to the things of God that if massive hailstorms were to break out, what would we just call it? Climate change. It's just climate change. Oh, look, all, those, all that livestock's dying. That's just, you know, climate change. The cows are, are farting too much. Okay, this is the nonsense that we have in our world. You say, I didn't know you could say that in a sermon. I just said it. But this is right. We've got to, we've got to reduce the emissions that cows are putting out because it's ruining our environment. And so we would just chalk all of this judgment up to natural causes. And in fact, that's what many have tried to do. And they go back and try to rewrite the plagues as if these are just natural occurrences. Well, you see, there's a red tide that can come in the water when the water gets stirred up at a certain point of year. So that's probably what happened in the Nile. And then when that's stirred up in the Nile, you know, it caused all the frogs to have to get out of the water. And so that's where all the frogs came from. And then the frogs all died. So then that brought on the gnats because, you know, when frogs are dead, there's, there's gnats and there's flies and all those types of things. Listen, this is not, you're like, well, that's crazy. Well, that's what folks have tried to do with the plagues. Go back and, and say, well, these, we can explain all of these things naturally as we try to write God out of it. That's what we do in our culture. This would just be climate change. This would just be coincidence. This would just be things that are happening because we don't want to deal with the fact that God has a right to judge his people. He has created all of us. 
And he has a right to tell us what we should and should not do. And when we don't live up to that, we deserve judgment. And he is bringing and raining down judgment upon the people of Egypt. And yet he is protecting and saving the people of Israel. No doubt, no doubt, a foreshadowing, as all of this is, of the division that will be made between the people of God who are in Christ and the people who are outside of Christ. See, we live in a world that doesn't want to deal with moral absolutes, and we're okay with thinking that someone might judge the wicked. We're just never okay with counting ourselves among the wicked because there's always someone out there who's more wicked. And so, sure, God can judge those who have murdered. God can judge those who are, you know, serving life sentences because they deserve it. But me, you know, I haven't been that bad. So why would God judge me? And, and we tend to make ourselves out as if we were God, we would be more benevolent and loving than he is. But if we just would examine our own hearts and the way that we judge people around us in our hearts and in our minds every day, we would find out we are not nearly as gracious and long-suffering and patient with people as God is. Yes, he judges the wicked. Yes, he judges sin, and he has every right to do so. But the justice of God lines up with the love and the grace and the mercy of God, which he abounds in. Abounding in steadfast love is who God is and who he'll show himself to be to Moses later on in the book of Exodus. So we can't have one without the other. There are exclusions that are made. There are distinctions that are made. And we see these distinctions all throughout the Bible. And I want to show you just a couple of distinctions made in the New Testament so that we don't think that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are different. There is still division that happens. There are still distinctions that happen. And now those distinctions and divisions are made because of Jesus. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, verses 51 through 53, Jesus himself says this, do you think that I came here to bring peace on earth? Well, he did in a sense, but he also says, no, I tell you, I will bring division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against mother, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Why will they be divided? Because of where they stand with Christ Jesus. And we don't think about this, and, and maybe some of you do in your own family situations. If you have a family like mine, which I know a lot of you do, everyone in my family, in my immediate family, my, my mom, my dad, my brother, his wife, they're all followers of Christ. There, there's no distinction between us. We have been saved by faith in the finished work of Christ. But in many places around the world, division comes real quick when someone makes a stand for Jesus Christ. In the Middle East, when a Muslim decides to leave the faith because they have encountered Jesus, all of a sudden, a father and a mother are divided against their daughter, their son. They must flee sometimes to get away. Because Jesus brings that kind of division. A distinction is made. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, there's more distinction and division that Jesus brings in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Paul's writing in Romans chapter 8 to tell us you're either in the flesh or you're in the spirit. There's a distinction made between those who walk in the flesh and those who walk in the spirit. He says those who walk in the flesh cannot please God. Earlier on in Romans chapter 5, he's made another distinction, and our students heard about this at camp. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin, and this way death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law, 
But sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who do not sin, who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a type of the coming one. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if by one's man, one man's trespass the many died, how much more has the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many. There is a distinction between those who are in Adam and who are in Christ. If you're in Adam this morning, you are still in your sin. And you, one day, will face the coming judgment of God. If you are in Christ, you'll be like the people of Israel throughout these plagues. You will escape the judgment. You will escape the wrath because the wrath and the judgment has been poured upon Jesus Christ for you. That's what happens on the cross. A distinction is made for those who will come by faith to Jesus Christ. The judgment that you deserve, the wrath that you deserve is poured out upon Jesus as he sheds his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that you and I don't face it. That's what's being pictured here throughout these plagues. As God's people escape the judgment that is coming to the rest of the world, in this case in Egypt, all around them. We see in the heart of Pharaoh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, multiple different instances where the Lord speaks to him through his servant Moses. We see in Pharaoh's heart that he wants to show some signs of repentance, but he's not really showing a sign of repentance. It's more like when you find out what your kid has been doing and they're not really sorry about it. They're just sorry that they got caught, okay? That's what worldly sorrow and repentance looks like. And Pharaoh's giving us an example of that here throughout all of these plagues. He's saying, I, okay, I get it. I get it. I know who he is now. I'll let you go. But then when it comes down to it, he starts asking questions. Well, who needs to go? And, and he says, well, Moses says, everybody. We're taking everyone. And we're taking all our stuff. And, and Pharaoh says, well, why don't you just take the, the young, able-bodied men? And so the Lord says, okay, you don't get it. Here comes another sign. Here comes more judgment. And later he says, well, okay, you can go, but leave your, leave your livestock. And Moses says, no, we don't, we're going to have to make sacrifices. We've got to worship. And we don't know what we'll need. So we've got to take it all with us. Either it all comes or we don't go. And, and Pharaoh says, nope, that's not happening. And so he wants reprieve from this judgment. He wants the Lord to relent, but he doesn't want to change his heart. He's, he's sorry that he's in the situation, but he's not sorry enough to actually change anything. And sometimes that, that's what happens in our own life with our own repentance, our own worldly sorrow over the things that we have done. If it just gets down to it, we find out we're not really sorry about what we've done. We're just sorry that somebody found out that we've done it. We're not sorry that we've sinned. We're just sorry that someone has caught us in our sin. But what biblical repentance looks like is we turn from our sin and start living differently. We don't return back to it. It's not, it's not perfection. It doesn't mean that once you ever repent from a sin, if you ever do that sin again, you are condemned again. That's not what I mean. As Paul tells us in Romans 8, that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus was perfect because we cannot be. So we get his righteousness. That's why there's no condemnation. But repentance is shown by the fruit. It's shown by what we do in response to that repentance. It's not just worldly sorrow that says, man, I'm sorry I did that. It's sorrow that leads to change. And for Pharaoh, that's not where he's at. His heart is hard. And you say, well, who hardened it? Is the Lord hardening? Is Pharaoh hardening it? Is it just hard? Well, the Lord has created us in such a way that the choices we make form our character. They form us into who we are. And, and sometimes when we just continue to make 
poor choices. Our heart gets harder and harder and harder. And a part of God's judgment is just saying, here, have what you would like. In hardening Pharaoh's heart, the Lord is just saying to him, that's what you want. Here you go. Have it. This is the Romans 1 world that we live in. I often hear, you know, if we don't turn around in this nation, we're going to face the judgment of God. And I just simply respond to that saying, look around, we already are. Because part of God's judgment, and especially in the 21st century, it's, it's not plagues of hell and locusts raining down. It's the debauchery and the depravity that we see all around us. As Romans 1, Paul tells us, he's just given people over to a depraved mind. This is what you want. You want things that are unnatural. You want sexual relationships that are unnatural. Have at it and see the destruction that it brings. You don't believe me? Read Romans chapter 1. That is the exact description of what Paul writes. He just says, fine. Have it. Have it your way. And so Pharaoh has, has hardened his heart to the Lord for so long. The Lord just keeps saying to him, have it your way. Have it your way. You're against me, I will judge you. You're against me, I'll continue to judge me. I will harden your heart. I will continue to bring judgment upon you as long as you continue to ignore and refuse to see who I am. And the scary part is, is we don't know when we reach that point to when God just turns us over to our depraved mind. That's what Romans 1 says. If there comes a point where the Lord just turns us over, says, have it your way. We don't know when that point is. And so the, the reality for us is that here's why the author of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart against him. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart because you don't know when you might reach that point where the Lord just says, wipe my hands of you and I'll turn you over to a depraved mind. That's hard for us to hear. It's hard for us to hear, but it's a part of who God is. Okay, I'm not making this up. This all comes from the word of God. I know we want to present God as just this loving, benevolent, gracious, kind king who will only do good things, but with him there comes judgment and justice because it is right for him to do so. But along with that comes this long-standing, patient steadfast offer of grace through his son, Jesus Christ. And so he, he says to Pharaoh, I, I'll harden your heart. But what he shows throughout all of this is that he is indeed the God of all creation, including you and I. He leaves no doubt as to who he is. He leaves no doubt that he is indeed Yahweh, the great I am. In his description in the lead up to the bringing of the hail upon the land, there is a lot more detail there than with any of the other ones. And he says a few things that I don't have time to, to dive further into, but just know that there is reason, there is a goal behind all of these things. He says in chapter 9, verse 15, he says, By now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, and you would have been obliterated from the earth. He said, I could have just wiped you out. If I wanted to, that's not what I'm doing. I have a reason for all of this. He says, verse 16, and however, I have let you live for this purpose to show you my power and to make my name known on the whole earth. See, here's what will happen. Egypt will know that the Lord is who he says he is. And when the people of Israel leave Egypt, they will know that he is who he says he is. And for generations, they will tell the story of what the Lord did in the land of Egypt. And others will know that the Lord is who he says he is. He says, I will make my name known throughout the whole earth because of these plagues. He says, but you, you're still acting arrogantly against my people by not letting them go. 
See, here's the reality. He is the God of all. There's nothing we do that is hidden from him. There is nothing we do that can cause us to escape him. And so we have to be careful in this day and age not to harden our hearts against him. We have to be careful in this day and age to not harden our hearts against the word of God. Author of Hebrews again tells us the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. No creature, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Pharaoh is facing the Lord to whom he must give an account. And one day, friends, whether you believe it or not, you will give an account to the Lord. You will give an account to the Lord. And you say, man, I don't believe that. You'll believe it one day. You'll believe it one day. And I'll just tell you this morning. It would be far better for you to believe it today than it would to be find out on that day when you stand before him. It would be far better for you today to say, I believe, Lord. And I know that my account is no good. I know that my account is full of sin. My account is full of darkness. And, and yet there is the light of Jesus that shines in the darkness as we read in John chapter 1. So when we give account to him, if we're in Christ, it's not our account that will matter. It's the account of Jesus, what he has done, and he has lived a perfectly righteous life, and he has died a substitutionary death in your place and in my place for my sin, and he has shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins because you and I could never find forgiveness on our own. But Jesus has bought and purchased it for us. And just as we read from John chapter 1, in him, in that word made flesh, was the light. And that life was the life of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. There was darkness in the land of Egypt. But the light of God still shone through the people of Israel. For us today, there's darkness all around us, but the light of Christ still shines through. So does that light live in you? That light can live in you. If you'll simply confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he has been raised from the dead, you will be saved and that light will shine through the darkness of your heart and come and take up residence in your life. For we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For it's God who said, let light shine out of darkness is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Has the light of God's glory shone in you? If not, today do not harden your heart against the word of God, but place your faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Sometimes there are hard things that we have to just reckon with, and I know it's not fun to think about judgment. It's not fun to think about your wrath, but we see it poured out upon Egypt in the book of Exodus. And if we have the eyes to see it, we can see it in our world around us as you've just, in so many ways, given people the desires of their hearts, and the desires of their hearts are not for you, but it is for the things of this world. So in a world where we, we can see the darkness sometimes, 
You, you turn on the news and you're reminded of the darkness. You look at social media, you're reminded of darkness. But it's sometimes in the darkness when I think about our brothers and sisters in places around the world where it would be illegal for them to gather like this, where it would be illegal for them to have their own copy of the Bible where they could follow along with the pastor, where it would be illegal for them to share what Christ has done for them. Sometimes it's in those dark places that your light shines the brightest. The darkness cannot overcome the light of Christ. And so may we shine that light wherever we go. Father, if there is a heart here this morning that that light of Christ, your glory in his face has not shone through, I pray that today by your Holy Spirit that light would invade. That you would open up their eyes to the beauty and majesty of who Jesus is. You would open up their mouths to confess him as Lord and open up their hearts to believe that you raised him from the dead so that they might be saved. Lord, we're yours. We need you. We need you every day. We need you every hour. You're our hope. You're our peace. You're our comfort. You're our joy in this world that we live in. May we look to you and you alone, and may you have your way in us. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. As we stand and sing this morning, song of response. I just invite you, as we always do, if the Lord is speaking to you, if you feel the Spirit moving in your heart and your life, you come, you respond. Whether that's questions about salvation, love to help you discern that. Maybe you know you need to, to be baptized. You've given your life to Christ, but you've not made that public through baptism. Love to talk to you about that. Or maybe this is just the place you want to call home, you and your family want to make this your church family. I'd love to talk with you. Be, be down front. Maybe there's just other things you need. Maybe you realize just as I spent just a few moments talking about Pharaoh and his worldly repentance that that's what you've been doing. That that's how you've been dealing with your sin and today you need to truly repent. To leave that sin here and to walk away living differently. Maybe you just need to come to do that. Spend some time in prayer. Maybe you just need to respond in your worship. I don't know, but I do know that when we hear the word, there's always a response. So as the Spirit leads, you respond.
sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly buried he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul Heavenly Father, may that be the cry of our hearts as we go throughout this week. How great you are. It is on display all around us, but give us eyes to see it. It's shown to us through your creation. It's shown to us through your people. So may we see not just coincidence this week, not just happenstance, but your providence. To see you working in and through all things to accomplish your purposes. And Lord, may we see you in all of your greatness and in all of your glory. And we fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. May we lean the hopes of our hearts fully upon his finished work. And may we enjoy your presence wherever we go. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Reminder, back tonight, we hope you'll come here, missions recap and business meeting. Uh, no service this Wednesday. No service this Wednesday. And uh, come next Sunday, we'll let you know. I don't know if we'll be in here or another room, but we will worship. So we love you guys. Have a great week.